Hello, my name is Chris Rafferty. I'm a graduate student at UNCW with a focus on English studies, and um, I like critical theory. So that's kind of like what I like to focus on. My presentation is on Viet Thanh Nguyen and his collection of short stories entitled The Refugees. Um, these three quotes on this slide here, um, I elevate to highlight the themes in, in the text that we're gonna be going over. Um, the first one, I'm mentally colonized. Uh, this is Nguyen saying, we are fashioned from cloth that we do not create. The second one, all wars are fought twice, the first time on the battlefield, the second in memory. He talks about how his history is contested even by himself. And the last one, um, if you are not in power in your society because you're marginalized in some way, the terms of your representation are not up to you. So basically he's saying representation equates to power. He's a professor and an activist and a Pulitzer Prize winner. He was born in Vietnam and uh, became a refugee when he was four, when his family fled South Vietnam to the United States in 1975. Problem. Um, the quote on the first slide is a repeat here, um, and it kind of encapsulates what Nguyen is focusing his scholarship on. Um, it's the crux of what his activism scholarship and literature seeks to highlight it's about representation. He wants minority communities to represent themselves to avoid colonizer trope reproduction that protects the colonizer hege hegemony. He highlights a common Asian American trope on the slide here, the ideal and unideal refugees. These refugee traits are problematized because when the US and Vietnam War created refugees running from the very communist forces Asian Americans supported being an anti-imperialist, anti-racist, anti-war and anti-patriarchal movement. This new wave of refugees then represented both ideal and unideal traits and created contradictions within the community that Nguyen admits Asian American discourses is still theorizing about because no community is monolithic. They're comprised of many communities with many views. Representation of collective memories create industries of memory which perpetuate unethical memories. These quotes on this slide are Nguyen's remembrances of what he thought as a teen while watching these famous and still popular movies that depict Vietnamese people in ways that Nguyen does not recognize. They're also examples of unethical representations of a minority community because the minority community had no input into fashioning them. His Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Sympathizer, has a, um, has a retelling of the making of Apocalypse Now from a Vietnamese perspective. To Nguyen, we need more of that. He believes minorities must represent their perspectives or they will suffer misrepresentation from communities that profit off of this misinformation. This here, this list, is a partial uh, taxonomy of his memory work uh, scholarship. His short story uh, collection, The Refugees, focuses on characters who are burdened by a lack of ethical memories. The key words here, ethical memory, memory work that recalls both one's own as well as others, memory and forgetting are dual functioning. Um, collective memory, there's a, there's a reason why we know about the Boston Tea Party as a country, we've decided to use that memory to define that part of our story. Secondhand memories um, are stories that I've heard. For example, if you were alive at the time of um, when JFK was shot, John Lennon was shot, or Reagan, or more recently when the Twin Towers fell, or even when you found out that there was a pandemic, you would remember that and you would share that with your community. You would talk about it. It would be something that, that you elevated in your conversations. That's secondhand memories of other people's experiencing things that you've experienced. And then there's generational inheritance of traumatic memory. For example, um, my grandparents were immigrants from Ireland in 1920. 
they lived well into the 80s, 1980s, and, and still told the story of how my grandmother's father didn't want them to enter the U.S. via Ellis Island because they'd been told that they shaved heads of the immigrants there. And my great-grandfather didn't want uh, my grandmother Molly to have her long black hair cut. So they, they came in through Canada. But she still, talk, she still talked about it, like, the year of her death. And, it, and now I'm talking about it now, a hundred years later. That is generational inheritance of traumatic memory, something that really affected them, I'm still talking about. Noonan writes that he hesitates to use the term unethical memory because the ethical and unethical sit on a spectrum where an unethical memory could be a partial memory or a complete false narrative. For example, he refers to the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., a 150-yard long monument inscribed with the names of the American soldiers that died in that war. To argue that it, he argues that it commemorates a partial memory. It needs a plaque added to it to recognize what the equivalent monument in Vietnam would look like. Nguyen calculates it would be nine miles long. He argues the effort to include this additional perspective would create a more just understanding of the past. But as it stands, such monuments unavoidably traffic in industries of memory. A monetization of partial or misrepresenting mem memories that fail the ethical memory test. Double ethical memory, what is necessary for a double ethical memory is the awareness of forgetting, which reminds us that all classes and groups are invested in strategic forgetting for the sake of their own interests. As noted before, Apocalypse Now and Rambo are examples of why double ethical memory matters. Newman makes clear that minority uh, memories will not be saved unless the minorities find a way to save them because this remembering or forgetting binary does not preclude hegemonic forces swooping in to fill perceived representational voids with false narratives that serve the hegemon. W.E.B. Du Bois writes, suppose the only Negro who survived some centuries hence was the Negro painted by white Americans in the novels and essays they have written. In this quote, Du Bois alludes to historical misrepresentation via mimetic essentialism. He blames a lack of black artist self-representations in the national hegemon that uses white representation of black artists. Like Du Bois, Nguyen also considers art to be propaganda and that minority communities need to view art as such because as Edward Said and Bell folks reveal, it has historically been used this way to the detriment of minority communities. This is how racist tropes are created, reproduced, and perpetuated. In The Refugees, Nguyen ties belonging in communities with the reproduction of self-representational stories in communities. For example, literature like The Refugees tells stories about Vietnamese refugees who live in the United States. The text is written by a Vietnamese American refugee. The content might be contested by, uh, by outsiders as unethical, but Nguyen would suggest all views are welcome, as long as all of them are included in the memory and not just the ones that serve communities outside of the demographic being represented. The stories are powerful. Each focuses on aspects of subaltern in minority community experiences. The story arcs Always threaten erasure is the character seek to belong. Not incidentally, it is a particular fear of Nunez, this erasure. More and more thinkers have concluded that there is no such thing as Asian American identity. That was a quote by Nunez. For a person who fears cultural erasure, he is not wrong to fear the implications of post-identity discourse. Arjun Apadore, a professor of anthropology and scholar, of South Asian discourses, I think he's at Duke, posits all identities that rely upon a hyphen to fully identify. He says uh, they're all one ideological step away from erasure. This problematizes identity via cultural signification and suggests that societal changes via demographic shifts will be less important 
when fading nation states force minority communities to make a choice, which hegemon will you choose? If the choice is between belonging in erasure, news scholarship, and the refugees themes suggest he chooses belonging. Of all the stories in the refugees that most illustrates Nguyen's concerns, I'd love you to want me is the most useful for my purpose of highlighting Nguyen's ethical memory taxonomy. In it, we see Nguyen explore the idea of self-representation's importance in the formation of identity. A Vietnamese American marriage is squeezed by the challenges brought about by a medical condition, which brings symptoms of selective forgetting. Most notably, Mr. Khan keeps mistaking his wife, Mrs. Khan, for an unknown woman who he holds in romantic regard. Her name is Yen. Mrs. Khan's reaction to this attempt to reinscribe her identity creates an illustration of Nguyen's ethical memory in action. She writes in his memory journal, Today I called my wife by the name of Yen. Unquote. The sentence seems innocuous, but Mrs. Khan forges her husband's handwriting, so he will assume that he has written it. She seeks to reinscribe his memory to replace his false memories with her true memories. So she writes in the journal, quote, this mistake must not be repeated, unquote. This moment in the story is a metaphor representing how hegemons can reinscribe the histories of subaltern populations with false narratives, despite active measures to prevent it. To make matters worse, as her husband's condition worsens, her family pressures her to accommodate his selective memory. This represents society's gaslighting populations into submission, telling them to get into line, do what they're told to assimilate. That was what the melting pot narrative was about. In the story, the wife finds herself relinquishing her hegemon identifiers. She loses her employment status, social status, family status, and now she doesn't even belong in her own marriage, which results in Mrs. Khan answering to a new signification. She is now Yen, a new name her husband has superimposed on her. To Mrs. Khan, it is an empty signifier, but to her disabled husband who no longer knows Mrs. Khan, this new name, this new identity is as real as his own. Mrs. Khan's identity reinscription is then complete in the story. Her only hope to regain her identity is the death of her husband, who in this story is a metaphor for the hegemon. Additionally, I'd Love You to Want Me can be read as an allegory for memory's role in the creation of identity. That is the huge stakes that ownership of self-identity carries and the understanding that to relinquish memories, whether consensually or not, is to relinquish identity. It also illustrates the double ethical memory I referenced before, that remembering is always aware of itself as being open-ended and in flux, rather than being satisfied with fixity and conclusiveness. That last sentence was Nguyen. Nguyen. In conclusion, Whereas ethical memory concerns itself with representation of perspectives, double ethical memory is that plus consensual forgetting, because forgetting is key to individual memory. While selective memory is fundamental to nationalism, such as ideological and political propaganda. This idea ties Nguyen's concept of double ethical memory to the wielding of power who and what is remembered or forgotten, he posits, will always be tied to who benefits from it. Therefore, it behooves people to acknowledge at the very least an awareness of forgetting, this is a quote, an awareness of forgetting because haunted by the inevitability of forgetting something, ethical remembering constantly tries to recall what might be overlooked. Thank you for listening to my talk.